Now at five, we've got two traffic alerts for you involving a water main break and down power lines that sparked a brush fire. And we're told the roads aren't supposed to reopen until late tonight. Plus, the problem is not going to go away. It's going to get bigger. A big discussion about Portland's homeless crisis with business owners getting more and more frustrated as we head into the holiday shopping season. And new developments in the impeachment inquiry with a man connected to the president's lawyer now wanting to testify. The News at 5 starts now. This is KGW News at 5. He had what appeared to just be a typical flu in a 10-year-old girl. But it was much more serious than a typical flu for 10-year-old Eva McCoy. Some sort of mystery virus was attacking the Canby girl's liver, and she had to be rushed to Seattle for an emergency transplant. Eva is now recovering at Seattle Children's Hospital, but doctors still don't know how she got so sick. KGW's Art Edwards talked to her parents today. So, Art, how's she doing? She's doing better. You know, doctors have been able to bring her out of the medically induced coma. So they've been able to do that. She was talking and Initially, when they first brought her out of that coma, uh, although her parents now say she's not saying a whole lot and today has been a very challenging day medically for her. Now, this all started back on November 9th when Raleen McCoy thought that Eva had the flu. Her symptoms continued to get worse, so they took her to an emergency room. Their test showed that her liver had stopped working. Doctors here contacted Seattle Children's Hospital and she was transferred there. Doctors said that Eva suffered a very rare form of liver failure. They don't know exactly what causes it. Just that the only cure is a new liver, a new healthy liver. Within a day, she got the transplant. This is going to be a really long journey for us. We're in crisis mode right now. And when crisis mode is over, we have to establish a new normal with our family divided in two cities and travel back and forth. We'll have to live here for six weeks to two months, uh, three months potentially. Now, Raleen is also encouraging all parents to get their children their vaccinations. She said that if her daughter had not gotten all of her vaccinations, she would not have been able to get that transplant. The McCoys have received a lot of support since all of this started from Canby, where they live, and also from other places. A GoFundMe page has been set up. You can go to KGW.com where you will find a link to that page. Maggie? Our hearts go out to that family and that little girl. Art, thank you so much for the info. But right, we're going to change gears now and turn to a few traffic alerts for you. The first one, power lines fell onto Hillsborough Highway and sparked a brush fire. And this is a live look right now at the work that crews are doing on the road. Part of that street at this point is closed and will likely stay closed until late tonight. Here's a map actually for reference. Highway 219 is shut down from the intersection with Laurel Road to Woolsbourne Avenue. Crews say they quickly put out the brush fire, but more than 300 people are without power and they say at this point they don't know what caused those lines to fall. ODOT is telling us that road is not expected to reopen until 11 tonight. We'll keep you posted. In Tigard, Greenfield Drive is shut down thanks to, as you can probably guess by that video, a water main break. Crews shut water off in that area and they're hoping to get this fixed by midnight. They say at this point they don't know what caused that break. All right, let's take a live look outside at Pacific City. A gorgeous shot at the Oregon coast. Well done, sky cameras. Holiday travel, by the way, is getting underway. It's crazy to think of that. A lot of people starting to hit the road for Thanksgiving. And today they had a nice, nice, clear weather for driving. That's always good, but we're told that could soon change. Meteorologist Joe Ranieri here now with the details. Hey, Joe. Hey there, Maggie. Yes, we are going to be seeing those changes, not throughout the next couple of hours, but definitely really after midnight is when we'll be seeing a front move through. That was a relatively weak system that's going to be dropping in some light rain and mostly cloudy skies. As you walk out there right now, we have some high clouds popping up on the uh, satellite map, really not going to be impacting us, but those clouds turn from high to low clouds over the next uh, six to eight hours or so. You can see picking up some rain throughout parts of Puget Sound right now. I'm expecting to see that window when the rain arrives really early tomorrow morning and then by the later part of tomorrow afternoon, we'll start to see some drier conditions out there. You can see another gorgeous spot on the Oregon coast, a little bit of that pink sky out in the distance in Newport, a temperature of 45 degrees. Now, as we look at the weather headlines, I know a lot of people are anticipating a lot of traveling, of course, and the weather will hold up for the most part. So here's a look what you'll be seeing for tomorrow. The rain returns uh, Sunday, snow levels drop for the mountains, and I just looked at some updated models, Maggie, and there is a slight chance to see maybe a wintry mix uh, here and there late 
Tuesday night and into Wednesday morning. That's about 500 feet and above. I'll talk more about that, and that's what we call a bit of a tease. Back to you. <laughs> All right, Joe. Well done. Thank you so much. <laughs> hey, we're going to turn now to Portland's housing crisis and a big public forum aimed at finding solutions. And we've obviously heard and said lines like that before, talking about potential solutions. But today, the timing is worth noting. Mayor Ted Wheeler is nearing the end of his first term, and he's announced that he wants the job again in 2020. That said, a record high number of people are sleeping on our streets. And ahead of the holiday shopping season, business owners downtown are reportedly getting more and more frustrated. Brittany Falkers reports. Unless you're living in a cave, you cannot be unaware of the crisis that we have in our community. That crisis can be seen in nearly every corner of the city. This problem is not going to go away. It's going to get bigger. And we have to take every resource we have to, to stop it. That's why Saturday, people from all walks of life filled downtown Portland's Unitarian Church to confront homelessness head on. Here to listen, there's a similar model. Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler, who last month confirmed he will run for a second term next year. His campaign is already underway and the housing crisis may be its biggest hurdle. Look, people are really angry and they're really frustrated by the homeless crisis. And I get that. And as mayor, uh, it's important for me to not only cheerlead for the city and say how much I love the city and how great it is, but to acknowledge there's some really big problems here and people are suffering as a result of those problems. Saturday's forum comes as the number of people sleeping on our streets sits at a record high. More than 2,000, according to Multnomah County's last point-in-time count, released earlier this year. And new reports are shedding light on just how frustrated business owners are downtown. Many of them are worried about employee safety. According to Willamette Week, some even suggested the city get rid of a service that gives the homeless free hot soup because they believe it draws more homeless people to the area. And with the holiday season in full swing, there's concern from shoppers about downtown safety. So Saturday, dozens grabbed a seat at the table. They heard from experts on things like affordable housing and mental and physical health. Then they broke off into groups to brainstorm solutions. It allows us to understand that it really is all of those perspectives that allow us to find solutions because we're all impacted by all of those perspectives. People with unique backgrounds, from business owners and their employees to homeowners and students, and those who know firsthand what it's like to experience homelessness. We're in the transitional phase. People like Catherine Gavin. Born and raised in Portland, she found herself without a home for two years until she reached out for help. And I was really curious and interested to listen and learn about uh, my hometown and how I could be of service to the community by participating and being present to those things. Those experiencing homelessness also shared their stories on the panel. Pamela Ward lost her husband in a hit and run in 2011. After that, she lived above a meth lab and had to leave to keep her family safe. She says the first step in finding solutions is understanding that each person living on the street has a different story to tell. So I think awareness is a big thing for Portland, the people of the city of Portland, really, and understanding sort of the root causes of why this is happening and why it's just gotten to this point. You know, mental health and addiction, they just seem to, for some reason, you know, one follows the other and vice versa. So we're going to try to see if we can't solve some problems today. With each idea placed on the wall of solutions, the goal is to get one step closer to fixing a crisis together. Mayor Wheeler hopes that some of the ideas generated today will one day become action. He pointed to other concepts that came from the community, like the street response team that was just approved by the city council, and the hygiene pilot program, which provided, among other things, mobile showers around the city. Back to you. All right, Brittany, thank you. Now to new developments in the impeachment inquiry into President Trump. New State Department documents appear to connect the president's personal lawyer and the secretary of state just before the president removed the ambassador to Ukraine. At the same time, one of Rudy Giuliani's associates wants to testify that a top Republican lawmaker met with a former Ukrainian prosecutor to get dirt on Joe Biden and his son. Here's NBC's Chris Pallone. 
The State Department released nearly 100 pages of documents late Friday night, which revealed the White House acted as a go-between connecting President Trump's personal attorney, Rudolph Giuliani, with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. The papers appear to show two phone calls between the men shortly before the president recalled the ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch. She testified to the House Intelligence Committee this week that Giuliani orchestrated a smear campaign against her to justify her removal. What I do wonder is why it was necessary to smear my reputation. An ethics watchdog group filed a Freedom of Information Act request to obtain the documents, which also show six former Ukraine ambassadors objected to uncorroborated allegations against Yovanovitch. At the same time, the attorney for an indicted former Giuliani associate says his client wants to testify in the impeachment inquiry. Joseph Bondi says Lev Parnas would tell Congress that Republican Congressman Devin Nunes met with Ukraine's former top prosecutor last year to discuss investigating former Vice President Joe Biden and his son. If true, it would mean Nunes was involved in the very plot the committee he sits on is investigating. Nunes has told several news outlets the allegation is demonstrably false and scandalous. And on Fox News, Giuliani distanced himself from his former associate. Poor Lev, I don't know what he's doing to himself. I think once again, that's going to be uh, shown to be provably untrue. With no more depositions or public testimony scheduled, House Democrats presiding over the impeachment inquiry are now pondering their next move and considering these recent developments. Chris Pallone, NBC News. All right, closer to home, one of the occupiers in the 2016 standoff at the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge in Eastern Oregon is now running for Congress. Kenneth Medenbach was acquitted along with other defendants for his actions in Burns, but he was convicted in a separate land occupation case. And in a post on his Facebook page, Medenbach says that's the reason he decided to run. He says he appealed that case up to the U.S. Supreme Court, but they declined to hear it. Medenbach is running to replace Greg Walden, who recently announced his upcoming retirement. Well, some volunteers in Portland are making sure that everyone gets a Thanksgiving meal. How many baskets of food they packed up at Union Gospel Mission? That's coming up. And hey, speaking of the holidays, the KGW Great Toy Drive is going on now. And check this out. Our own Joe Ranieri was out with Matt Safino and Nina Melhoff this afternoon collecting toys at the Fred Meyer on Northeast Widler in Portland. You can donate to the Great Toy Drive at any Regents, IQ Credit Union branch, or local Toyota dealerships. We'll be right back.